Hill for joining us as speakers today for this really tremendous topic of how a bank can nourish a community. And I will jump into the fact that I will mute people <laughs> to minimize the background noise. If you're on the phone, if you're joining us from the phone, please mute yourself so that you can unmute yourself uh, if you want to ask a question. Um, and uh, if I still hear background noise, I'll just uh, mute everyone. But in the interest of keeping this somewhat conversational, I will, um, uh, I will let people self-regulate on the muting. Great. So yeah, can a bank nourish a community? A pretty meaningful topic. I think nowadays more than uh, uh, ever before. Uh, Kat will be speaking about it from her perspective as, uh, a, as an impact investor and as co-founder and co-CEO of the Beneficial State Bank. And uh, Aaron Kilmer Neal, coming from a deep uh, body of work with uh, Bali, uh, and now as chief impact uh, chief impact officer of the Beneficial State Foundation. Uh, first of all, a uh, very quick uh, investor network update. I wanted to welcome a few of our new members. We're delighted to have you join us: uh, the Libra Foundation, Trillium Asset Management, uh, and Lethal Partners. They have been tremendous supporters, all of them, since the beginning of uh, Transform Finance. So diving into the, um, uh, into the content for today, let's look at it from the perspective as always of the role of banks and how that intersects with the transformative finance principles. Banking has quite understandably gotten a bit of a bad reputation lately. And uh, we would like to view it not as a, as a matter of demonizing banks, but really going to our usual perspective of viewing banking as a tool, like everything else in the financial system, something that can be, good, be used as a force for good, something that historically has played a tremendous role in, um, in supporting the growth of the, of the economy, and that over time has... Um, uh, uh, has fallen maybe a little bit off of the rails. Uh, can you all still see the slides? Because I cannot see them at the moment. If you can't see them, okay, let me try it again and see if they come back up. Okay, do we have them now? Yes. Great, so let's go back to that. So let's look at banking yeah, in the in the context of the transformative finance principles, banking, that is something that should be uh, a tool for, uh, for helping finance the type of projects and the type of uh, economy that we would like to see. Something that does not often end up being that way, especially as we look to it uh, from the standpoint of the role that communities are invited to play in it both in the design of what a banking system would look like that serves, uh, serves the community's interests and aspirations in terms of the governance and what voice they have over the way that banking plays out and in terms of ownership and uh, who really benefits from banking, who really gets to derive value from it, whether it is something that is for the, um, uh, to the benefit of communities or, frankly, in a self-referential way to the benefit of bankers. Um, looking at it also from the standpoint of uh, extractiveness, of whether we are creating more value for the communities than what is taken out, is banking something that can be additive and how do we ensure that that is the case? And finally, as we have seen in particular through the... Um, uh, through, the through the latest financial crisis, um, the issues in banking in terms of fair location of the risks that come with it, the risks of a credit economy uh, and the formation of debt. So the way that I would like to, um, to frame the question for today's presentation is very simple. Wh who is banking meant to serve? Is it meant to serve the communities? Is it meant to serve the bankers themselves? And is there a way in which we can look at it differently? And I will turn it over to Kat and to Erin, who have been working at Beneficial State Bank and the Beneficial State Foundation at trying to crack this nut. So thank you both, Kat and Erin, for joining us. I'm really delighted to have you here. Absolutely. Thank you, Andre and Transform Finance. This is a terrific opportunity for us to talk about banking. 
Aaron and I are going to tag team back and forth a bit. But um, first, in terms of Transform Finance, the membership and community concerns that Andrea just was uh, going over, banking couldn't be more central. Um, it's not only something that we must own and make serve uh, individuals, communities, and the environment, but we can't <clears throat> afford not to. Um, it enjoys an enormous number of collectively derived prerogatives, and it's very powerful, arguably the most powerful thing in the American economy. And so we'll go over that in the problem statement a bit, um, but concentrate most of our time on the opportunity that we have to redesign banking uh, as a collective. <clears throat> so the way we think about banking is as, as the original and most important form of crowdfunding. Um, everybody thinks of crowdfunding funding more in terms of Kickstarter and other efforts online for communities of users to come together and make something happen that they want to see happen. But if you think about what banking does, it is our collective um, decision to pool our deposits, our spare cash, into the banking system where it enjoys a, an awful lot of power to both finance the economy, amplify the money supply, and create real outcomes. At present, there are about $12 trillion of deposits in the banking system that's far larger than any one industry. And it, it, it amplifies things in the economy, which I'll explain in a moment. So the problem is, as a crowdfunding model, it's been broken. Over many, many decades, we've allowed banks to convince the depositors who are the crowd um, and the stakeholders of a bank who are deemed by uh, the public um, to be worthy of merit and service have been ignored, if not abused. Um, you know these facts and figures probably better than anyone in your community, but um, there's a reason why banks are held uh, in low esteem. In the latest Gallup poll, for instance, banks came in third from the bottom, only above oil and gas and the federal government at, at, among the top 100 industries. So a few indicators of how badly the banks are serving us and what power they have to wreak the damage are that $235 billion of fines have been paid related to abuse of bank customers. Um, that is considered merely a cost of doing business, and that's only what they've paid since 2007. It does not make any less lucrative the business lines in which they commit those consumer abuses. So it isn't a deterrent uh, uh, at all. Also, nearly 5 million families lost their homes to foreclosure in the bank uh, um, crisis and the foreclosure and housing bubble uh, that resulted. Uh, the housing bust, excuse me. And that is a, a very deleterious fact because that's not only homes, the place where people live and uh, rely on for stability, that is the American way that nest eggs, that assets are built. So that's a two for damage. Um, in addition, uh, banking has been very rough on communities of color. They have been disproportionately impacted. Uh, and this on top of what is already an economy filled with bias. Um, uh, and lastly, one third of all bank tellers are on some form of public assistance. That's the socialization of a private cost that redounds to the benefit of private shareholders. So how um, we went about this was to say, it's not uh, that we need to leave the banking system, it just must be changed. And it must be changed at the system level. Um, but we need to design a bank model that has a, um, a theory of change and a strategy for uh, yielding change at the systems level. Um, a new model to change the banking system for good. We founded a bank in 2007. Those were momentous times. That was the eve of the credit contraction and financial crisis with a triple bottom line focus. We were one of the last charters let. Uh, we serve social justice, environmental resilience and economic sustainability. And we've grown to about 630 million in assets covering a bio region constituted by California, Oregon and Washington. We are a beneficial state bank, but we also own 90% of Albina Community Bank, a historic um, bank that served African-American communities in Portland. Um, and we are in a definitive agreement to merge subject to regulatory approval with Finance and Thrift and Pan-American Banks, Finance and Thrift serving 
five uh, Central Valley cities in California, primarily with auto lending and furniture and small business lending, and Pan American, a historic uh, Hispanic Latino bank in East LA and North Hollywood. This would bring us to 750 million in assets, 250 colleagues in 18 locations across our bioregional footprint. That is still very small compared to the banking industry. Uh, at 750 million in assets, that pales, that is like car change to B of A, which is 2 trillion in assets. Bank of America actually had a $4 billion capital account error ride their balance sheet for 12 months without their audit committee knowing it. That's scary in terms of too big to fail and uh, too big to manage the size of these large money center banks. But honestly, that's an error term for them too. It did cancel their dividend, but it's a tiny amount of money cons considering what they manage. So we needed a bank model that was agile and radical and transformative. And we set about doing it to deliver health access and prosperity for all through banking, not um, around banking or instead of banking, but through banking. Um, the first thing we did was give 100% of the economic interests of the bank to a public charity foundation. We wanted to align the ownership and the governance in the public interest. The reason it's so important and actually uh, should not be allowed not to be true about banks that they're governed in the public interest is that they enjoy an enormous amount of public prerogative. First of all, we use FDIC insurance to make it possible for any depositor to be uh, to deposit in a bank risk free up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That results in a, in that two trillion dollars of deposit gathering and the lowest cost funding in the American economy. I'm not sure that even securitization when all is said and done will be lower. But for instance, right now, our cost of funds is 34 basis points. Um, that's very powerful funding and it has to be used in the public interest. If it's not in terms of safety and soundness, for instance, it would jeopardize the FDIC insurance fund, which it did during the Great Recession. And that's a, a fund that's ultimately backed by the American taxpayer. Also, uh, we are allowed to collect those deposits and put it into a model that has huge leverage. We have the most conservative capital ratio at 10%, but that still means that we are levering equity capital 10 to 1 with deposit capital. And that's before you get to the real credit creation power of the fractional reserve central banking system. That's just the leverage in the bank model itself. Um, so. Uh, in addition, uh, lending is a process that's recycling. The capital goes out in loans, but 98% or more of it better come back to us or we'll be in regulatory trouble. And that means it has a, um, a cumulative power as well because it keeps going out, doing something and coming back to go out again. So it's really important that those $12 trillion in such a dynamic, powerful system be governed in the public interest. The economic rights that are owned by the Public Charity Foundation, Beneficial State Foundation, can never be controlled by a private individual. The board of Beneficial State Foundation is appointed by other public charities, Bridge Housing, representing fair uh, and, excuse me, access to fair and safe housing for all, the Tides Foundation, representing community economic development, and until recently, East Bay College Fund, we're actually going to be um, switching to another uh, larger foundation, but they have helped us hold the torch for access to fair and high quality higher education. Um, there is no private shareholder in the bank model, no one to insist on short-term profit maximization, which usually comes at the expense of a triple bottom line, and no private individual can ever gain control of the board. Moreover, if and when profits are distributed, they can only go to our public charity economic owner. Um, that would be in the dividend process. And once that those profits are received, that public charity foundation can only reinvest them back into the low income communities that we serve and the environment upon which we all depend. So that creates a virtuous profit taking cycle on the back end of the bank that matches the crowdfunding process on the front end of the bank. 
Um, we hold these core values at both the bank and the foundation level, trust. There isn't a financial service institution in the world that can operate for long without trust. Uh, you'd be surprised how little trust there is in banks, but there's a perceived or perception that there's no alternative. Justice, this is at the core of what we do. We need an equitable development model and an equitable banking model and empowerment. We are not the heroes in this story. Our customers are, whether they're depositors, transactors, borrowers, or the communities and environment stakeholders that we serve. We add a fourth value. It's not on this page, but it's creativity because we are definitely on the design side. We have to make a lot of this up as we go. This is a depiction of our unique ownership model. Uh, this is not something that could be replicated broadly throughout the system, as you might imagine. We aren't aware of another economic ownership model like this, but it is not precluded from future capital formation. It is our intention this year actually to raise outside capital from the massive amount of charitable capital waiting in the wings for a stronger vehicle and model for change. Uh, so it would be possible for us to sell stock to uh, an individual family office, private foundation or commun uh, community foundation, as long as it were held in their charitable vehicle and therefore adhering to our ownership and government governance model and uh, outcomes. <clears throat> oh, that's just a little amplification of it all. Um, the second design feature of the bank is total transparency. Our aim is to create benefit for all and harm to none. That's an ideal. We will not be perfect, but that is a far cry from what the banking system uh, is currently doing. If you, um, in order to achieve that total transparency, we have to adhere to a lot of self-assessments, third-party audits, and commitments and pledges. So we are third party audited in many ways. We are a community development financial institution regulated by treasury. That is a designation that's getting increasingly hard to get and keep. It requires now robust annual reporting to um, make it stick. We are also a B corporation. We are the second highest rated B corporation in America. Uh, and we strive to get higher every time we take the assessment. We are just labeled by the International Living Futures Institute. Actually, I'm gonna advance just a second because I think we have a slide that, oh, nope, nope, sorry. Um, you'll see a page of our certifications, but just is a label by the International Living Futures Institute that gets at the social justice practices of any American corporation, any corporation. Um, and it's, it uh, has us assess ourselves on uh, uh, practices like ethnic and gender diversity, labor practices, procurement, animal welfare, et cetera. We take that assessment every year and try to get better every time we take it. Um, we also uh, make commitments. We pay 150% of living wage in all markets. We'd like to move to 270% as our economic viability allows. That's Robert Reich's estimate of what it would take a uh, family, um, a household to be have a living wage. Um, and we don't finance coal, oil, gas, uh, et cetera. We took the Paris No Coal Pledge. We are trying right now to sign the Small Business Bill of Rights. Uh, we measure our ga greenhouse gas, landfill, and water footprint every year and try to drive it down. We have to be very data-driven. Uh, we would be pilloried if we were inaccurate in our reporting. So we are constantly trying to prove, improve our technology and data platforms, our data analysis, and subject it to third-party scrutiny. And then we publish the outcomes because it's very important for our stakeholders, especially our customers, to know what it is we are doing with their deposits. <clears throat> um, I think that there's a slide left out about lending practice, but maybe it's just up in. Well, the third design feature of the bank is really, really important. It's our lending practice. When I say banking is crowdfunding, we never mean that a specific deposit funds a specific loan, but all deposits fund a lending practice. Um, and you can bet that um, the kind of lending that we do is mimicked by the banks, but we have to look at everything they do. So in our case, our lending practice commitment is to put at least 75% of all loan dollars in the hands of the new economy. 
Those are borrowers who might be creating affordable housing, sustainable food, renewable energy, or they're borrowers who have a unique business structure like B corporations or cooperatives that are in the public interest, or there are communities and borrowers previously starved of capital, low income communities, women and minority owned businesses, the social sector, including nonprofits. Um, we, we also insist that the other 25% or less not be doing something against our mission. It can be neutral. But if you think about it, if those percentages were flipped, we'd just be reinstating the old economy, which has not been serving us for a long time. So we need to preponderantly lend to the new economy, and we need to be very transparent about what it is when, when what those outputs and outcomes are in the lending practice. Erin's going to discuss the outcomes more in more detail. Um, <clears throat> you might say that any bank, especially the big money center banks, do that kind of lending out of their CRA divisions, and they do. Honestly, bigger, better, faster, stronger than we can because they command the lion's share of the public subsidy for, for instance, low-income housing tax credits. But the problem is they're dragging a train of misery behind that shiny bright object, and that is that list of dis, um, dispiriting facts at the beginning of the presentation, the harm that they're doing. So that's what we need to stop. We need to create a banking system that's benefit all, harm to none. And in taking our commitments and being transparent, we are trying to show deposit capital, equity capital, and human capital that they can insist on more about what, who uses their deposits, what kind of company they're funding, and what kind of place they want to work for. <clears throat> um, so in addition to that, we do have to be a good bank. Uh, we do deliver fair and transparent personal banking services and business empowering business banking services. We do that also with a lot of intentionality. So we scrutinize our products to make sure that they're fair, that they don't have onerous fee structures, that they uh, are simple to understand. We do not churn accounts to try to maximize overdraft income, for instance. Um, we also customize lending products. To, we're trying to make our customers and borrowers more powerful, more impactful after they take our banking products than they were even before. And we're mission driven in everything that we do. Okay, now I think, oh, there's the all benefit, no harm. Um, here, uh, sorry. Um, so, Aaron, I'm not sure when you are jumping in here. Sorry, Oops. can you hear me? Yes, now. Okay, great. Sorry, my um, I have to do this from my phone because uh, it didn't work on my computer, so I was having a little technical difficulties. But I definitely can jump in here in a minute. I'm going to try and. Uh, just re-log in so that I can see the slides. So, But I think this is going to be a good chance for a breaking point and conversation and questions anyway. So I would welcome those for minutes as well. So I'm going to log out and log back in. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I, I'd love to answer questions. There is um, a section later in the presentation about where we are um, in terms of growth and financial resiliency, because that's important. I might say also, um, I mentioned our theory of change is first and foremost to be um, an economically viable, highly impactful bank model. Um, our theory of change is, is if we can demonstrate the viability of this um, and th it's the ability of this model to take market share, that would be deposit equity and human capital. And we have concrete evidence of that, that we hope the large regional banks um, will note and start uh, using, mimicking our practices to take market share from the top seven money center banks. It's not likely to us that the big money center banks are going to be able to change. They're, uh, they're so big and inflexible, it's going to be hard for them to change. Um, but these regionals are well poised to take advantage of all of the innovation of the banks of the future and uh, instill these mission-driven objectives in a way that redounds to their business success. A question on that, Kat, uh, while Erin uh, logs back in. Uh, on precisely on this relationship between the practices of beneficial state bank and uh, the system-wide approach to banking as a, as a whole, I, I know, it, I believe you're part of the Global Alliance on Banking Values. And as we look at 
really the, the transformative potential for, uh, for what you're doing and other actors are doing in this space. Is it your sense that this will be something that is limited to regional banks? It will be a minority approach to banking, minority in terms of the, the amount of assets that we're talking about. And even then, is that something that can eventually uh, grow as a, as a main area of banking? Or how are you seeing it yet at the systemic level? Sure. Um, so we are members of Global Alliance for Banking on Values which is an international light secretariat of banks, about 25 of them. They're mostly much larger than we are. They are those large regionals and they uh, have ex existed for quite a bit longer. Outside of America, there have been better bank models. Um, so those are banks like Triodos Bank in the Netherlands, GLS in Germany, Brocht Bank in um, Bangladesh, Mibanko in Peru, and they're more at the $20 billion level. That's still not nearly as big as the big uh, money center banks. But I think if um, if you look at a, a lot of the um, post-mortem on Dodd-Frank and the re-regulation of the banks, we still don't have it right. We still have system risk from institutions that are too big to fail. And even voices like Richard Fisher, the former head of the Dallas Fed, has said we need to go back and uh, downsize these banks. We have to break them up. Um, so one day, I believe the banking landscape will belong to the large regionals, and that will be appropriate from a system risk level and from a responsiveness level. All of the um, parameters that you all care so much about. It'll take a while to get there. I hope it doesn't take another crisis to get there. But right now, the big banks in this country are real have a lot of indigestion around their lending to the oil and gas industry. Um, so we espouse four rules from a policy standpoint alongside our practice theory of change. Like what we're trying to do is create a community of practice that can take the place of the old banking system, but we would be aided heavily by some policy changes. And those are that no bank in the uh, banking system be allowed to be bigger than a certain size. You could pick almost any number that doesn't end with trillion, but once they start approaching that size, that they have living wills that break them up, that they all have high capital buffers along the line of 10%, that would tend to slow growth a little bit, but give a lot more resiliency to the system, that none of them can use deposit funding to finance speculative securities investment. It's a wildly inappropriate mismatch to use deposit funding for those purposes, and that we let them fail. Every bank that fails, fails, no government assistance. And I mean that for us too. Uh, if you don't create the expectation that you will fail if you make the wrong risk reward bets, then uh, the, the economic shareholders are incented to, to goad management to take ever more risk. So with those, those four simple rules, which is a lot less than 1,500 pages of Dodd-Frank or whatever it turned out to be, we could have actually brought a lot of discipline to the banking system and turned it much more back to the principles that we're trying to seek. So we still agitate for that, but we have to have this community of practice uh, strategy too. Great. So uh, would it be fair to say that part of your impact is beyond just the, the banking practice within, uh, within your organization and the impact that Beneficial State Bank has directly? It has more of this kind of a, a proof of concept or a model that is uh, that you're putting out into the world for what a new way of regional banking could look like. Yes, and which will um, hopefully be in stark contrast to the next bank failure round when we see what it was that caused the failures, but yes. Great. Aaron? Yes, yeah, I'm here. Back. Oh, sorry. Uh, if you'll allow me, I see that Oscar has a question. Oscar, I've just unmuted you. If it's still okay. relevant now before Erin starts. Yeah, just really quickly, since um, you met, uh, I'm, I'm Oscar Abello from Next City, by the way. I'm not a me member of the network, but I, I write about these issues a lot. Uh, so my quick questions were about the acquiring the other bank, uh, Albina Community Bank. Um, two quick ones and then one maybe longer one. One, uh, was that merger subject to, to a CRA uh, evaluation? Two, did you submit a CRA plan as part of that merger? And three, do you, is, is merging part of, your, part of a strategy to kind of spread these values uh, throughout other parts of the financial system? 
Sure. If I could take those in reverse order, um, sure. we do. We have been growing at about twenty percent um, a year in the loan book, but it's a slow process to grow a bank. Um, and for us to have the influence, we think we need to have in our theory of change, we need to grow faster. So we do do what I would call align mergers and acquisitions, and it's subject to very strong principles. One, it has to be with a, a like-minded, mission-driven organization. Two, it has to be totally voluntary on both sides that both banks want to do it. Um, it needs to be in our geographic footprint because we don't feel like we could be responsive outside of that. And responsiveness is the flip side of accountability. We want it to uh, expand our geographic co cover within the footprint and add more um, impactful product offerings to what we can bring to our communities. Um, and the last is uh, that it create opportunity for both institutions and all individuals involved. We're not about contraction models of merger. Um, uh, we had our last CRA exam in 2010, and uh, as you know, you had to have a, a satisfactory or an outstanding in order to engage in merger activity at all. Um, and so we've been allowed to, on the basis of that last exam, to, um, to in the case of Albina, it wasn't a merger. We actually purchased new stock issued by Albina at the bank level to recapitalize the bank. Um, they had a hard time raising capital after the downturn and to meet their new capital requirements. So we were very honored and happy to put more capital in that bank so that it could keep fighting the good fight. We would love to own the rest of it, but there are some uh, Trump's owners from a prior capital raise in the mix. So um, that will take some time. Um, the, uh, the next merger, which is a true merger, a full purchase and a full merger and integration of the banks involves finance and third Pan America Bank and Beneficial State Bank. That is subject to regulatory approval under review right now. Um, we're hoping to close the end of this spring. We actually have our next CRA exam is in June, but the regulators so far want to go in that order. Um, Albina has had a CRA exam, I, I will say too, and they're satisfactory, but they're not part of this merger per se. Um, and uh, we have put in, we have not done a full blown strategic plan, particularly think about it, it's a little tricky because we have three banks coming together who have different but equally admirable approaches to CRA. Um, so ours has, has been, um, geographic, our assessment area has been geographic and beneficial state, but finance and thrift was a target market uh, approach to CRA. By the time you put together our uh, commercial lending into um, the mission areas I talked about, including uh, CRA qualifying census tract and so on, and the assiduous practice of high road auto lending that finance and thrift does, and the low income business and consumer lending that Pan American has done, we're hopeful and, and quite purposeful about making sure that we have an even stronger CRA story to tell, um, but that will all be presented to the regulators this June. Did I answer your question? <laughs> okay. Great. And uh, I will use uh, Oscar as the model for everybody else. Thank you, Oscar, for doing that. There is a chat function if you're dialed in through the um, uh, through the software, you will see a little bubble chat box uh, towards the bottom of your screen. Feel free to use that to, to contact the group uh, directly. And uh, this would be a great moment probably to turn it over to, to Aaron to tell us a little bit, yeah, about the, how, you're, um, how you're going about the impact piece and evaluation. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. I'm very excited to be part of this network. As I told Andrea and Morgan, I have a crush on you guys, so it's an <laughs> honor to participate today. Um, just before I uh, speak to the, the impact work that we're doing, I, um, I'm currently looking at the first slide of the presentation, so I'm not sure if everyone is, and I'm a little bit, uh, I can go ahead and just start pressing fast forward for myself to get myself up, but I just want to make sure I don't mess everyone else up if I do that. So Andrea, do you have advice? Uh, yeah, why don't you just tell me which slide you would like to be on and I'll make it happen. Okay, great. Uh, it is the mission criteria slide. I think it's number 16 or somewhere close to that. 
mission criteria slide. Okay. Yeah, just a few before that. So uh, okay. as Andrea, there you go. So as Andrea said, my role at uh, Beneficial State is at the foundation. Um, my role is Chief Impact Officer, and that role was created really to ensure that uh, the social and environmental impact is taken as seriously and in conjunction with uh, credit and lending. So just as we have a Chief Credit Officer and Chief Lending Officer, uh, we have the same for impact. And so I um, have the, the great fortune of, of having that role at this moment. And I love it. And so the work that we're doing right now is really to um, has been over the past year has been to create definitions, work on principles um, and build systems so that we can analyze, um, manage and measure our impact. So um, what we've talked about so far in terms of how we do that. Sorry, if I'm looking weird because I'm actually on a phone, so I keep moving the phone. Um, as Kat said, we do strive to all benefit and no harm, and that means that a preponderance of our loans, at least 75%, must be to change makers, um, and that none of that other 25% can be going against the good that we're trying to do in the world. In terms of how we define a change maker and what we're trying to support, we look at our commercial lending, our borrowers, um, in, in four different ways. One is ownership. So is this organization owned by um, someone who has had um, is underserved, has had uh, not as many opportunities to create family and self-sufficiency? Um, the second is structure. What is the structure of that business or organization? Um, what are the core products, services, and sector that that uh, company or nonprofit works in? And what are their practices? So I'll briefly just go into those in a bit more detail, um, although all of you, I'm sure, get this um, very fully. So the first is who owns it? So really, is it owned by someone from an underserved community and that by virtue of the fact that we're supporting this business or organization, we are helping them uh, build assets and build wealth, power and wealth in their own communities. Uh, so women, people of color, formerly incarcerated, disabled, and, and a wide variety of, uh, of people that we really wanna support. Secondly, is the structure of the organization or business mission driven? So is it a worker-owned co-op? Is it a benefit corporation, a social purpose corporation, a nonprofit, or some other uh, structure that really clearly um, shows us that the intention of that, that entity is mission first? Third is, is the core product or service mission aligned? What are they doing in the world? What are they working on that we wanna support, that we wanna see making change in our communities? And we've identified, um, through looking at our existing loan portfolio, as well as what we are intentionally trying to do in the world, uh, we've identified 10 areas that we really track and look for in our lending. And those are listed on the slide here, including affordable and multifamily housing, arts, culture, and community building, economic workforce and business development, education, and youth development, environmental sustainability, beneficial financial services, health and well-being, generally health and well-being, really food focus, um, making manufacturing and production and social justice. So those are areas that we're really focusing on and looking at when we're looking at lending. Finally, uh, what are the practices of the businesses and organizations that we're working with? So for example, perhaps there's a retail business that is owned by a white male in a um, you know, wealthier business district, for example. So if you look at those three areas that we already discussed, that business may not specifically fit in any of those in, in a way that we see as change making. But if that business is working to change, um, his uh, clothing, for example, from uh, either not sure what the sourcing and labor practices were around that clothing, or perhaps, you know, is, is clearly not a fair labor uh, 
clothing to something that he wants to change to um, fair labor practices and sweatshop free clothing. So that is a practice that you may not even notice when you look at that business from uh, a higher level. But when you dig in, you recognize that this, um, what may seem like a very simple business is really uh, making real change and has real intention in the community. So that's uh, the fourth area that we look at and we look at practices um, in a number of ways in terms of their certifications, how they treat employees, uh, what are their, do they have special products or pricing for underserved communities and a variety of other deeper practices. And I will jump in a second there, Erin, um, just to contextualize it for some of our members. We've, uh, we've had yeah. a lot of discussions in the past around yeah, this difference between investing in best in class type of entities versus investing in uh, or even uh, supporting through credit entities that have this potential to improve their impact over time, right? You, you start with a certain floor and then, uh, um, uh, and then you, you applaud their efforts at improving practices, even though if they were static at the point where you're coming in, it would not be that exciting uh, an entity inherently. And I think this maps well onto that floor and ladder approach of saying, let's, let, let's meet them where they are and let's see if through our um, financial support for them, whether as investors or as lenders, we can help them move further up uh, to the type of practices that we would support. And in the context of that, I might ask you, uh, do you, uh, does the bank actually provide that type of support of saying, oh, what you're doing is great with your somewhat conventional organization. Here are a few practices that you could be changing and improving and we'd be happy to either help you along the way or suggest ways in which you could improve your practices. Could, could I yeah, just add a great question? Yeah, go sorry. for it. Just before Aaron gets to the question you just asked, um, we run two venture funds alongside the bank because the new economy is going to be filled with startup organizations and banks are not good. They're not suitable sources of finance for startup entities. And I would say there, Andrea, the, the, we do not invest equity in companies unless they are totally transformative because that's very powerful investment capital. Whereas what you were describing as, you know, set a bar and look for a trajectory of improvement in a company feels much more comfortable for us on the debt side. Because, in fact, we can't have a brand, a totally new economy. We need to migrate a lot of existing firms into new practices. Terrific. Yes, exactly. And, and to answer that question, um, the answer is yes. And we're going to do more. So we definitely do have conversations. And a lot of the conversations that we're having are really through networks by inviting our clients to join us in um, event events and conversations that we host, whether they're forums or um, hosting a B Corp event or a social venture network event, so that we're starting to connect uh, people who might already be that 100% mission forward with those who uh, haven't put themselves in that category yet, but we're introducing them to those concepts. And we're also building, um, and I'll talk about in a second, uh, deeper dialogues with all of our borrowers in which we can really have more pointed individual one-on-one -on -one conversations about these. So uh, I would say the short answer is uh, yes, but much more in the works. And that community learning is not only super powerful in the way a lot of learning goes on these days, but it also protects us from something we have to steer clear of called lender liability. If a bank gives too much direct specific advice to a company, it can jeopardize its standing as a debtor. And in a, the worst case of a bankruptcy, actually not have the protections that it would as a debtor. So that's something from a regulatory standpoint, we have to be pretty careful about. Any other questions on that? Okay, so moving on, um, as we spoke about a few times before, one of the things that we really wanna make sure is that we're um, paying attention to and illuminating the fact that our goal is not only to really uh, fund those change makers and transform our economy from a positive standpoint, but really um, also avoiding those contra mission uh, practices and sectors that um, that really 
can go with uh, unsaid unless we really p look for them and point them out. And as Kat said, you know, we are a very tiny bank compared to many of the other banks. So if you look at uh, the, for example, the number of affordable housing units that we support compared to a big money center bank, those numbers might pale in comparison. But what we're trying really hard not to do is do all the damage on the other side. And that's where you'll see a huge difference between what we're doing and, and what the other banks are doing and talking about. We're not um, funding fracking that destroys the wells near the houses where we're trying to support affordable housing, for example. So we are in the process of building mission principles and guidelines that also focus on what, it, what contra mission means. Um, and that includes sectors, activities, uh, the transaction of the loan itself, uh, supply chain, profits, and, and many other areas, trying to really look deeply at these different, uh, at these different um, considerations. So there are some sectors that we are identifying as the sectors themselves are contramission, which I'll list in a, in a minute, but also looking beyond just what is the work, what are the um, products and services of that business, but are the businesses and projects community supported and benefiting? Um, does the transaction itself lead to more distributed ownership and power versus concentrated? Uh, are the types of ownership, uh, is it nearby? Is it one of the types of ownership um, that we've already talked about? Um, and then we talked about this just a moment ago of direction over absolute. So how do we take um, and move the needle for those who aren't the, the um, 100% mission forward businesses. So we are deeply in discussion of, of building those principles and um, look to many other organizations for advice, both um, principles that have already been established by experts in all the sectors, as well as one-on-one -on -one conversations and dialogues with experts in those sectors, because we're not necessarily an expert in every single um, area that we lend to that deep, deep level. And we want to make sure that we're reaching out to those who are so that we understand the complexities of each sector. Um, so other examples of business practices that we're looking at are, is it, um, you know, does the transaction lead to a monopoly or strong arming? Are, um, are the products themselves for disadvantaged individuals, but then the owners and shareholders are making excessive profits themselves? Um, does that business have a history of reducing quality or benefits um, in order to reduce costs. So really trying to look at all of those elements uh, in the businesses and the transactions themselves. So some of the specific sectors that we looked at um, that we have on our list of just uh, contra sectors are any exploitative industries, um, sexually exploitative industries, weapons, gambling, um, predatory financial products, tobacco, including e-cigarettes, illegal industries, obviously. Um, and corporate prisons and juvenile justice boot camps. So those are a few uh, that are almost absolutes, I would say, or pretty much absolutes. And then there's a lot of complexity uh, in in pretty much every other sector that that requires that deeper thinking that we were talking about and the principles that we are um, we've developed and are reviewing right now. And I would uh, add to that, Erin, uh, before yeah. we move on, that again, some of this might be familiar to, to the Investor Network membership in terms of our earlier discussions around negative KPIs and asking uh, even the most well-meaning of social entrepreneurs to be very thoughtful and uh, try to provide some information on what they're measuring in terms of the negative impacts that they could have through their, uh, through their activities we see. Uh, as you look at impact reports, especially for early stage companies, you see a lot of information on the on the good that they try to to do. And we find it very helpful to at least start asking the question about what kind of things are you looking out for that could be uh, negative. And I, I love the categories that you've uh, included there, including, for example, the uh, the emergence of monopolistic behavior, which is something that oftentimes is presented as a good thing on the financial side, but we should really be looking out for on the um, uh, on the social impact side. So thank you. Absolutely. Kat, did you want to add anything? No, I, I think we should get to outcomes. <laughs> <laughs> Great, let's do that. <laughs> so, um, this won't be uh, any surprise to anyone, but just wanted to give an example of sort of walking through 
from our theory of change and into the, the metrics and the data. So as one example of our mission is to, re, to protect our environment, uh, if, we, if we start walking through how we get from there to, to measurement, um, if that's the mission element and one of our goals is to help reverse climate change, uh, one of our strategies then is to fund clean renewable energy alternatives and avoid ourselves as well as di encourage divestment of dirty energy. Um, so then that means that if we want to do that, we need to measure for our lending portfolio what are the metric tons of, of carbon dioxide that are avoided or offset by our bank financing, for example, financing solar, wind, small-scale hydro, um, biodigesters, etc., and so then we need to we need to be collecting the you know the kilowatt hour capacity of each of those energy sources. Um, sorry, I hope I didn't just mess that up. Um, the number of uh, hours that those are running and really producing at the end of the day how much energy each of those um, uh, sources are producing collectively, and then how does that translate into uh, really air quality and um, uh, climate change impact. So we're looking at you know each of our mission elements, the goals and strategies, and how do we turn those into metrics that we can measure. So this is just and another you, example. Yeah. Sorry, how do you do that across so many different uh, different areas? Uh, if you're looking again at what the what the impact would be on the renewable energy side, on the affordable housing side. Etc. Uh, if you want to get to the right level of granularity, are you relying on experts or advocates within the sector, or you, have you found a different way of doing it? Well, we're um, we're getting deep right now in the two areas that you just mentioned: the renewable energy and affordable housing. And that has been a combination of um, you know industry standards as well as conversations, um, and you know looking at gears and iris and 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 in terms of determining exactly what the metrics themselves might be. Um, but we do have, as you saw in an earlier slide, we support a lot of different kinds. So your question is, is a really important one. We need to figure out how to go this deep in um, you know, our most common sectors. And we're working on that now. And I'll speak to that actually in a little bit. So at this point, the deepest sectors we do have are um, the renewable energy and affordable housing. And so this is a quick example of affordable housing. Um, so our, our lending from 2012 to 2014, you know, our belief is that housing is a human right. And so our work around affordable housing is to make loans um, to affordable housing, specifically affordable housing units and, and in conjunction with affordable housing developers, as well as other creative um, ideas that we're looking at and we'll talk about later. Um, so we have, you know, the output of how much we're putting out in terms of dollars and lending and then figuring out how many units does that support and for what length and at what level of affordability. And then finally, you know, when we're communicating this to um, our partners and our stakeholders, um, trying to help make all of these numbers meaningful for people. So just this is just an example of how we're working to make things meaningful for you know, that 2012 to 2014 period, uh, dedicated affordable units, so protected affordable units, we've, uh, we've supported over 750. But if you're not familiar with affordable housing, you don't really have any sense of context. And so this is not, this next number is not meant to be a comparison of, you know, what we're doing or how much more we're doing than any other community, but just to give people a sense of, you know, are we talking millions of homes or hundreds of homes in communities that um, need to be affordable. And so this meaning and context number is just sharing with um, folks to say that in San Francisco, for example, over the past 10 years, um, there have been a net increase of 108 dedicated affordable units each year over those 10 years. And so Again, not to be a direct comparison, but just to give people a sense of scale of what, what we need to be building in our communities. And so we're trying to do that with all of our metrics, um, not only provide the numbers, but provide some meaning behind them. So then really quickly, uh, our process. 
Uh, right now, our, our loan officers are having initial conversations. Um, for those of you who are data geeks, uh, we require our loan officers to at least at bare minimum put the uh, mission sectors and comments about their mission work generally in Salesforce at the very beginning so we can look at our pipeline and learn um, the basics of those businesses. And so they are providing the sectors and any notes. They, um, they do know the structure and they may be adding ownership. They may be adding practices, but a lot of that um, we analyze later. So that's <clears throat> before and during loan booking. After the loan is booked, you have our nerdy impact team who is looking in more deeply and, and pulling out the ownership, the practices, and any other elements that you can find. And then um, finally, we have a team of community engagement officers, a, a, a staff person at the foundation um, in each of our communities who will be doing impact interviews um, immediately after um, a client comes on board or a loan comes on board to ask. And we have a series of very specific questions around their practices, all of the things that I talked about earlier so that we can have a one-on-one -on -one interview and really learn more about them. And that, that moment um, is where we can do two of the things that, the two things that you asked about Andrea. One, to talk about what are resources for increased impact in the community in their particular sector, um, telling them about B Corp, telling them about other uh, resources that they may not know about and sharing any practices we have, whether it's our procurement policies or other policies that we can share as um, inspiration for change. And secondly, to help us understand their sector and their work better and say, what are your measures of success and how can we start to use those to, um, to incorporate into our own metrics? So those conversations will help us learn um, more about that. So. That is what the order of things right now, um, and what we're trying to, I'm just going to get to the next slide, what we're going to be doing shortly is moving that deeper conversation and those questions on the front end. And that will allow us not only to have a mission pipeline that tells us what sector they're in and some small details, but really say from the very beginning, these are the impacts that we expect this borrower or this loan to have and have that on the front end, along with the financials as part of that um, credit review. So this is just an example of some of our, um, our outcomes for um, our mission lending. And I will, uh, I'm not going to go into detail on those. It's just a, a sampling of some data. And I would I think it's better to spend our time in conversation rather than to to deeply jump into those. So I'll stop there for questions. And then after that, we, we can um, jump back over to Kat. So we just felt it was important to include some financial infographics. They're mostly evidencing trend lines of um, increasing success and robustness in the bank model. So we have been <clears throat> growing at a rapid clip. This is um, uh, at the bank holding company level. So it does include the um, Purchase of Shore Bank Pacific, at, which was a full merger back in 2011, and the 90% of uh, Albina Community Bank. But the trend lines for asset growth and net income have been very positive. This is the first year, for instance, that we'll be paying income tax. <clears throat> um, in addition, the loan growth, uh, which is holding steady at or around 20%, is uh, way out of size we, for uh, the market. We're small, so growth comes easier, but um, the bank average for loan growth since the crisis has been more like 8%. <clears throat> um, the return on uh, average equity and return on average assets is something we manage, but we think for resiliency that we should be at between 6 and 10% return on equity. Uh, above 10%, we feel like we're overcharging somebody. We should, we are not a profit maximization model. But below 6%, we don't have enough buffer to weather uh, economic cycles and so on. Um, that return on average assets in 2015 is a, and equity is a little out of whack because of two factors. One is we recognize net operating loss um, assets as we turn into a tax-paying organization, so that's a little out of size. but. And also, when we bought Shore Bank Pacific, we took 
in a $12 million distressed loan portfolio. We chose a hold strategy because we thought we had the talent in the bank <laughs> to work those out. And they did actually, They have, we have ended up working the predominant of that portfolio out, which is good, not only from a financial return perspective, but it's also from a social benefit um, standpoint, it's much better to, for, to render sick loans well than to foreclose. <clears throat> Can I ask you one question, Kat, sure. on, uh, on the last uh, slide on the return on average equity? You said that you're shooting for a 6%, is that correct? 6 to 10% return Six on to equity. 6 to 10%. Uh, that, that seems to fit rather well with our, uh, with our efforts to wrap our head around what would be a non-extractive type of return on equity. So the way that you look at it is you target a certain range that yes. you have determined to be non-extractive, to, to use this language, and, and you manage towards that result, even if in some way you could have an higher, a, a higher return on average equity there. Yeah, yeah because the higher return would be coming at somebody else's expense likely and also we we kind of eschew volatility the global alliance for banking on values is doing a longitudinal study of returns to values driven banks versus traditional banks that they started in 2007 so it's early to make big pronouncements about it hi but good they, evening they well, out, the values driven banks have far outperformed the um other banks and a lot of that is by not low volatility return. So they're hitting six to 10% over that whole time period. Whereas the other banks were, you know, ratcheting up into 33% and negative, t you know, like, ugh. so we're looking for non-extractive returns and uh, low volatility. And that's a fairly unique approach, right? Not just within the banking sector, but in general to target a specific uh, equity return. Yes, <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> Great. I heard a voice. I don't know if it was a question or somebody just introducing themselves. No. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, cost of funds. That's the really powerful part of banking. 34 basis points funding. You can't find that many places. And you think about fintech right now. We embrace our regulators and we embrace fintech. We need that innovation and we need user-driven experience, uh, um, user-driven, customer-driven models and fintech is all over that <clears throat> fintech will have a hard time scaling unless it accesses low cost funding very hard to scale a business on 15 percent hedge fund debt <clears throat> we are happy to help them scale but they have to embrace our regulations and our duties and through the counterparty due diligence process so we work a lot with lend up and they've been very good about it took 18 months or something but it's a it's a lot of burden it's not just the safety and soundness regulatory uh, requirements. It's fair lending, uh, bank sec uh, secrecy, data pri data security, customer privacy, any money laundering. Those are all really important hallmarks of the banking sector, and <clears throat> we have to embrace them. And we should not share that 34 basis point cost of funds with anybody who doesn't. <clears throat> um, so uh, credit wise, also the bank has been steadily improving. The only reason it had fairly high Texas ratio and adverse asset ratios, which is an indication of credit risk in that 2012 period was that $12 million sick portfolio that we willingly bought in. We marked it and managed it in, um, uh, to, for improvement. And in, it is a big part of the credit ratios dropping, but also we hold dear uh, credit quality and a high credit culture. It's very important to the resiliency of any bank model. <clears throat> Um, efficiency ratio is coming down hard at our scale. One of the reasons we're trying to get bigger is influence and impact, but the other is to handle modern bank economics. We have very high overhead because of the regulatory and compliance burden. Um, so we need to drive this ratio down, but it will likely come as we scale uh, as, as well as get more efficient. <clears throat> the current ownership, we've been through that enough. <clears throat> We are out, as I mentioned, um, ex uh, testing um, a stock offering. This is not a stock offering, but we are looking at uh, providing the opportunity for charitable vehicles to buy a non-cumulative preferred stock that has a 3% coupon and a five-year put at cost. It will qualify as permanent tier one capital because the coupon 
<clears throat> is non-cumulative and the put is actually to my husband and myself. So it is our opportunity over the five year period to convince foundations, family offices and private uh, and community foundations that they that that bank stock represents one of their highest impact activities. It's certainly <clears throat> at um, a 3% coupon, uh, it, it that's uh, provides them with a lot of liquidity, particularly compared to a grant, which is negative 100%, or even a PRI, which are costly to manage. Um, and they can hold it as just a direct prudent investment, given how highly we're regulated in um, our business results. It is a direct prudent investment. 3% <clears throat> gives them some liquidity. They also get their pro rata share of our impact output and outcome uh, and all the things that Aaron and the team is working so hard to both um, verify, inspire, and demonstrate. Um, so the, the put option is at cost. If five years has been enough and they simply want to cash out, the stock reverts to Tom and myself at cost um, and the voting rights, I mean, the uh, economic rights remain in the Beneficial State Foundation. Um, if they choose to convert, then they join our ownership as a nonprofit, just like our own nonprofit. Uh, and we think that they uh, become part of the pluralization of our ownership model as well. More voices put more and different people in charge. And uh, it had, we have the opportunity to maybe extend that kind of investment and ownership potential uh, to non-standard organizations, including our own employees through maybe an ESOP at some point. So we're trying to build a bank model that's resilient for the future and has uh, increasingly a uh, broader and shared base of ownership, governance, and impact. Great. If uh, we, we yes. you can stick on that for a second, because part of why I was really excited to do this uh, with our investor network now was uh, because you're at the, still at the exploratory phase of this, and it'll be very exciting to see where you where you land with it. So, to understand it correctly, it is similar to like an equal exchange type of uh, preferred stock model for financing cooperatives, but then it has this potential conversion that is missing in the co-op financing piece. So yes. essentially, you'd say you come in during the years in which you're holding the preferred stock. You you're showing your commitment to the to the mission of the of the bank, and then after that period, you you almost have a buy-in right, and you can become part of the actual ownership. Yes. So you're basically a debt provider until the experience convinces you that you want to be an owner. Great. And that's a mutual. Um, agreed upon conversion so it's a chance for each party to get to know you know the, the bank to get to know the potential new owner and the potential new owner to get to know the bank and its practices and strategy and the three percent coupon is uh, fixed and declared or would you be able to change it up or down uh so the testing is partly to see if that is sufficient you know what the if you will, market rate of return would need to be on a debt instrument like that with the conversion potential. Mm -hmm. But it would not be variable through those five years. I, we haven't considered that. It, it could be. It has to be non-cumulative uh, in order mm -hmm. to satisfy the tier one capital requirements of banking. But we could actually execute a side contract oh, just as the put is a, is a private side contract to Tom and myself. We could have some um, return uh, feature that isn't dependent upon the bank is dependent upon something else, and it could be variable with performance or impact. Or this is all to be figured out. We'll put it in the hands of a family office, a private foundation, and a community foundation in the next six months, and get some sort of real time feedback from them. or multiples of those two. Another, uh, short of investing in the bank itself, we think we have a pay for performance model that's private and simple. So most pay for performance, like social impact bonds, involve a three-way contract uh, and certainly a government entity where the cost savings to government is what's gonna pay back the bondholders. We re realized in actually doing one by accident that we have a similar opportunity. It's not unlike um, those of you familiar with housing finance, 
uh, when, when you buy down interest rates. Um, so in our um, version, the bank would recruit private capital in the form of a grant to buy down the interest rate for a borrower producing a verifiable social or environmental benefit. So it could be additional kilowatts of renewable energy, more units of affordable housing, more living wage, fully benefited jobs. Um, it would be a contract in that the interest rate would be rebated upon production and verification of those benefits, uh, but it would accomplish a number of things. One is it uh, would render the borrower who does produce those positive externalities, if you think about it that way, uh, a lower cost of debt, which is a significant competitive advantage in their marketplace. Um, it would also compensate from a return perspective, even say a private investor landlord in multifamily. Um, if we could uh, give them back in interest rebate what they lose in net operating income by stabilizing re uh, rents at affordable levels, even workforce affordability, then they don't they can keep their commitment to their investor base, but stabilize rents, stabilize tenancy, and we get the benefit of riding out the economic cycle during which we often lose all the affordable housing and the economic boom, and it never gets built back in the um, when markets correct. Um, so we we did one of these by accident, I'll say, because we provided a tranche of subordinated debt at six percent for a very high road employer in a high unemployment community, Roseburg, Oregon, in order to add a line of 40 to 60 really high impact jobs, uh, skilled, well compensated, benefited with a lot of circulatory impact in that economy. Um, they otherwise could not have afforded, the, the senior debt would have been out of covenant and the company would have been stressed by debt service if they had gotten that subordinated debt at market rates. We lent it at 6% and we monetized the lost income, uh, in, interest income in the jobs that were produced. Um, so that's a pay for performance model, if you will. Uh, and it not only makes the borrower more competitive because they're pro producing those social benefits, it makes us more competitive because we can provide a loan product at a price that the bank market in general will not supply. The, the reason I put this in the impact opportunity or investment opportunity is that it's also a pretty small amount um, of money, period. It's much less money to buy down an interest rate two to 4% than it is to put up the capital to build the housing or uh, the new line of jobs or whatever it is in the first place. So it's a, a huge amount of leverage and a relatively small grant. Um, and it's a good way, we think, to for outside providers of charitable capital to get to know the real uh, impact of a bank like this, which is its lending, the power it has to direct its lending. I think this is just a um, list of what I was just describing, sorry. Um, so our tagline is build something beautiful because uh, we are really just a mentor along the way, an enabler for um, the crowd to direct its deposits and the crowd to use those deposits in loans to create the world that they want to live in. So this is a, a radical transformation of banking back to what it was intended to be. I mean, it's not meant to be uh, a concentrator of power and an aggrandizer of private profit and benefit. It belongs to the crowd and it, its benefits need to redound to the crowd. Here's one crowd member. Wow. All right. Amazing. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. I don't want to hog the line with my own special interests here. I will unmute those that are on mute, and if I hear noise, we'll, we'll go back to mute. I have a question. Uh, this is um, Amin Benali with the Local Enterprise Assistance Fund. We are a CDFI loan fund in the Boston area. And going to your slide about um, foundations, endowments, I was wondering if you could maybe speak a little bit about um, if you've ever encountered um, total return requirements 
that are perhaps far greater than what the instrument um, you know, is designed to provide and what sort of narrative you have or what sort of response you have to, to, to that type of feedback that, that I think a lot of us have received from, from several of these private investors and, and, and foundations. I confessing ignorance. Can you describe more what you mean or what they mean by total return requirements? When we go out with an instrument with these sort of returns that we can show them that we have received historically, um, and we're talking about low single digit returns, um, what we get back um, is well, we you know, we have responsibility to provide greater returns, um, mid single digits to high single digits. And um, unfortunately, it's, um, it, it prevents from moving to kind of deeper stages of, of involvement with, with, that, with that group. And you know, different people have different responses, different offices have different responses. But I'm wondering if it is something that you have encountered, something you have had to deal with, and, and what experiences you have had um, dealing with that. Yeah, um, and that is a little bit what informs our 6 to 10% re uh, target return. But uh, there is still an expectation in the market that there's something called benchmark returns and we should be able to meet it and achieve the impact. Correct. Um, I think it it's an evolution in thinking. And uh, so we go where people are and then we don't try to convince them that they should sacrifice return. We just try to um, educate them about uh, what the impact is because there, there's... I mean, in, in, in a family office, say, there, there, people are actually quite willing to make grants, which are a negative 100% return with highly murky attribution and results. And then they leap right up to benchmark returns for anything above a PRI. So we just kind of try to walk through life with people. I, I'm actually on one of the Harvard boards, and I have an excruciatingly frustrating time there because I think we're actually looking for... Um, exploitative return, which is absolutely inherently leading to financing, investing in destructive activities. You know, it's like, oh my goodness, we could do so much better um, uh, to not hit financial benchmarks <laughs> across the board. But, um, so I'm not sure I'm answering your question fully, but I wanted to just say, since you are representing a loan fund, we love working with loan funds because there are many financial intermediaries and we need them all and they all have different uh, cost structures and therefore and uh, different opportunities, unique opportunities. So I'll just use as one example. We work with Opportunity Fund, great loan fund. They have a much lower cost of customer acquisition and underwriting for say things like uh, truck retrofit in the Central Valley to reduce pollution along Highway 99 where 80% of the kids have asthma and 80% of the source cause is truck pollution. It, for us, if we were to try to originate those truck loans, they'd be overpriced for the borrower and that we wouldn't make many of them. So the best use of our capital is to, re, is to wholesale finance opportunity fund. It's good for them because we recycle their capital and they can make many, many more loans. And it's good for the borrower because we don't wanna force high price debt on them just because our cost structure is lousy. And it's good for the bank because it's a full deployment of their balance sheet. So something like that, like d bringing potential investors into the actual mechanics of how finance moves through the economy it might be um, one way that we can um, get more flexibility about what return is appropriate where, even at the same time, we have to be very honest about what it is we're actually producing. Great. So if there are no more questions or Erin, unless you had something to add, I was wondering if we could go back uh, for a second to the issue yeah, of uh, how you're going to be filling out the, the various categories of, uh, of standards, let's say, you know, what will count as uh, affordable housing. I see there was a, a question earlier yeah, on, uh, on how beneficial state banks is the, the level of affordability. I imagine for quality jobs, we have some of the same discussions. Is it, uh, is it just uh, uh, you know, a sustainable livelihood plus benefits? That is, does it also include uh, 
opportunities for advancement and opportunities for ownership. So within each category, the more you want to do a good job, the more you end up really you know, digging deep into this, uh, this rabbit hole, which is fundamental and which we're happy to, to do uh, as Transform Finance. Uh, and I'm wondering, yeah, what kind of um, relationships or what kind of techniques you've found in order to do that. For us, part of uh, what we've landed on is this idea of really, if we're serious about representing and lifting up the voices of those who are normally excluded from these conversations, it is to go to the workers' rights advocates or the labor rights groups and asking them, what does a good job mean to your constituents, for example, right? Uh, I, sitting in my position, it's kind of hard for me to imagine fully what would be a good retail job in Southern California for a single mother of two. Um, what, what approach have you taken? What have you been looking at in terms of really reaching the right folks that can tell you what the right type of impact would be for them? Yeah, so um, just to answer the specific affordable housing question first and then the broader question, in terms of the affordable housing question, the number that I put up on the screen, sort of when we aggregate and just say affordable housing, that is at 60% uh, affordability. And um, that's based on the Federal Housing Finance Agency definition and, and then HUD limits. But we do um, look at the affordability of every single unit and we do have quite a range from uh, 20, 30, 50, 60% up into more closer to the workforce development, um, you know, 100 and 120%. So we measure all of those. And we, um, when we are using the phrase affordable for our purposes, we're talking about 60 and below. Um, in terms of uh, answering that question of digging deep into every, every sector, every question, every practice, um, I would say it's two part and nothing um, that should surprise you. One is to reach out and to look at the, um, you know, the industry leading organizations and that, and by industry meaning, I mean, um, not only government agencies, but also um, practitioners and advocates. And so looking at the principles and the criteria that have already been established um, and then actually having conversations with folks. So, on the on the uh, jobs piece in particular, um, we've looked at uh, uh, inner city advisors and their fund good jobs definition. We've looked at uh, looked through labor and uh, quite a few other sources to come up with some potential um, criteria for what we call a good job. But we're also having uh, conversations with others one on one about that. And then the same with affordable housing. So I mentioned that, of course, using HUD. Uh, definitions in the federal finance and uh, housing agency uh, definitions, but also um, reaching out here, for example, in, in California to our partners at um, Bridge Housing, which is an affordable housing developer, to the University of California, uh, where there are experts to um, uh, advocates like uh, Cosa Justa Just Cause, which is a, you know, grassroots uh, organization. So really trying to start with the what's already written, what's already there from um, trusted resources of people who really do have social and economic justice in mind, as well as then after sort of doing that first level research, having the conversations. So could I just add to that um, when Aaron's saying we measure, we have a portfolio of, of houses that was reported affordable housing that is technically compliant with HUD and deed restricted. We also have a category of housing that's practically affordable, meaning it it isn't deed restricted. Uh, it may not be motivated by any of the same uh, intention, but practically speaking, it complies with affordability. And the important thing about that to me is is not is that once you identify that, you can see that that's something we'd like to figure out a way to structurally protect. So how can we incent that to become effectively deed restricted by its financing? So put financing on it that would prevent it from reverting to market rate, especially between economic cycles when it's so vulnerable. Um, and also it opens up your eyes to some basic facts of life, which is the by far dominant source of um, investment for housing is private. And if we don't 
find a way to make the private markets comply with affordability, it's going to be really hard to do it with a relatively small reservation of publicly funded housing. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for uh, for this. Thank you for walking us through. I think there are a lot of uh, possibilities for engagement on the part of our network and its members uh, with uh, with what you're doing, both on that capital raise as it uh, developed, but also I think in terms of sharing some of the best practices that that you in particular, Erin, comes up with on the on the impact side and some of the work that we've been doing on setting standards around quality jobs and uh, and other similar verticals. So I really appreciate everything that you do. Uh, I think this uh, this was really an, an eye opener in terms of a very concrete example of how you can go into the belly of the beast, as uh, you were saying at the at the beginning, Kat, not working around banking, but working through banking and in the process of doing that, really setting a, a clear example of how things can be done differently and through the numbers that you showed actually be a sustainable enterprise. Uh, and thank you for joining us and for spending some time with us today. I really appreciate